Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, I'm going to go through the, the report very quickly. Um, if you want, download it from the internet. It is about 70 pages, but it's in color, so <laughs> enjoy. Um, this is the first report we have done of this type uh, in our strategic plan for new rules for global finance. Uh, we were mandated to look at the whole system of global financial regulating bodies. And we've identified these bodies, uh, go through that. But first, let me be polite and thank our host, ODI, Kevin Watkins, Dirk Villam, and Victoria have been an, a marvelous team to work with, as well as Development Finance International, whose director is here, Matthew Martin, and Jeanette is here. So they did the work, and I get the glory. So it's a great division of labor. <laughs> um, and, and Matthew and John are both board members of New Rules for Global Finance, so they're holding me accountable. Um, <coughs> the approach that New Rules takes, it's a focus on those not in the, the deciding room. We ask three simple questions. Who wins, who loses, and who decides? And then in this governance section, we ask who's in the room and deciding. And we presume if you're not in the room and you're not even allowed in the building, you probably are not going to be a winner. I mean, that's a good Las Vegas bet. So that's why for us governance is very important. And we have quite a track record in, in, in governance work, especially vis-a-vis -vis the IMF. So with that, I want to point out that this is a combined effort. We have authors from all of these different institutions, 10 different institutions, as well as three academics from um, Erica Leiner from University of Waterloo in Canada, Kunibert Raffer from University of Vienna, and Andrew Kornford, who's a longtime researcher with um, UNCTAD in Geneva. So with this fifth anniversary of the G20 summit in London, which was probably one of the most successful of the G20 summits. We thought it was very important to say, how are they doing so far? How does this governance system that we present to you today, how is it functioning? Are we any better off? What do we have left to do? So with that, I'm going to play with this little toy here, okay? Uh, why is it that we're setting about with this report? and the, the mandate from my board is to do it annually, so we'll see how that goes. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> in 2007-2008 was the worst since the Great Depression. It was left on, it was deliberately deregulated because everyone was convinced, or at least in a certain school of, of economics and of uh, economic thinking, uh, free capital unfettered capital would be more efficient, more productive, and it was a great consensus, but it didn't seem to hold out. So what are the institutions we're looking at very specifically? And these are in alphabetical order, because <coughs> we couldn't make a decision based on hierarchy, therefore we let the alphabet, alphabet speak to us. The Financial Stability Board, as many of you know, is a collection of the 25 largest economies so it goes beyond the G20, and it is their regulators. In the United States and from the United Kingdom, for example, you would have a team of three when the group meets in plenary once or twice a year. And you can't tell when it's going to meet. It's very unpublic. Not secret, just not public. So the um, Financial Stability Board has been very active. They get their mandate from the G20. They are now incorporated in Switzerland. They do have a budget. Next in line is the G20. The G20 is very powerful. Is it effective? Is it legitimate? Uh, it does not have a, a specific mandate. It does what it, its members decide among themselves to do. So we, will look, we look at that. Then the International Monetary Fund this is something I've been working on. I like to say that I started working on it when I was pregnant, and uh, the child is now almost 25. <laughs> uh, the World Bank, uh, this is not an area that I focus on, but 
Um, others in the room are expert in it, so you can ask them questions. And then international tax rule makers. And here, this is a cluster that seems to be deliberately ad hoc and um, I call it chaotic in the, in the report. And that section of the report, you will see that <coughs> I did not plagiarize. I just have extended quotes. And we look at the OECD, the IMF, and the UN, all three in their um, tax rulemaking function. So what is the overall look of governance? We have four categories. Uh, we have excellent, good, moderate, and poor. And the, we, have, we identify the overall gap in good governance as 55%. Now, numbers are symbols. Don't get carried away with the numbers. This is a visual. People love pictures. They love numbers. This is illustrative, OK? Um, some people focus on it. I break out in hives when I have to do numbers, so my colleague at work did the numbers. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a very quick summary. And you can tell um, how well or poorly different institutions are doing. And when I met with the IMF staff, for example, I said, now, the numbers are illustrative. This is our first time. Please, a lot of tolerance. They said, oh, we're better than the World Bank. Thank God. No, that's not, that's, sorry, sorry, folks, but that's a little, I know. Anyway, but in, in um, the governance, the most important thing for trying to understand our approach to governance is uh, you have the handout. And it, we have what we call a governance scorecard. And I want to focus on the governance because we're asking how, how fit is this financial system for today's world. So we have four criteria, transparency, accountability, inclusiveness, and responsibility. Now transparency is pretty obvious. Accountability is intended within this framework as the institution following its own rules, its own mandate. If it is like the IMF, it's set up, it's a UN agency, it has certain responsibilities. Therefore, uh, it's required to follow that. And do they follow their own rules? That's that question. Inclusiveness, mm -hmm. um, contemporary political science and governance, <coughs> has stretched way beyond the nation state, which was the norm at the time the bank and fund and the United Nations were established. How does inclusiveness play right now? And that usually includes parliamentarians. I love it when people say, we're going non-governmental, we're going to talk to the parliament. I just, I'm sorry, I just scream. I'm sorry, the parliament is part of government. You can't call them non-governmental organizations. That, that's, that's one of my buttons that gets pressed. But you do need to include the, the parliaments as well as the media, mm. academics, people who are impacted by the decisions of the institution. And then responsibility. This is the least popular among the institutions. How can we be held accountable for decisions that usually have to be implemented on the nation state level? But at least again from the perspective of the IMF, many conditions are increasingly um, touching on areas that are national responsibilities. So is it fair to hold the parliament accountable when they are responding to requirements from an international body? It's an interesting question. And then again, if there are consequences for people in their lives, and again, we focus on the poorest countries and real economy, um, if people are negatively impacted by the activities of these institutions, international law says they have no obligation to do anything, but is there an ethical and an, an emerging principle that they should? How am I doing on time? You've, uh, you've been going for seven minutes. OK, great. Now, just to, to continue with this, um, <coughs> our measurement indicators, we then uh, tried to set up, and these are just illustrative that are on the slide. You have the whole uh, scorecard. We identified 
what I call was taught way back when I was in education in the last century. We had to have <coughs> behavioral <coughs> objectives. How can you tell whether someone has learned something? How can you tell that things are different? What are the observable changes? Mm -hmm. And you need to be able to identify the target, the goal, or the ideal. And then you identify markers that move you toward that goal. And we've done this for each of the, the performance categories as well as for the criteria. And we put in excruciating detail. And my poor colleague put all these details on. He said, you got way too many. And he says, no. So we'll see what happens this year. So overall, um, we look at governance. Much of global financial governance remains non-transparent, non-inclusive, largely unaccountable, and I would say irresponsible, or non-responsive, <coughs> I don't know. I call it irresponsible. That's the normative choice that I make. Um, we have seen considerable uh, improvements. Those are in the text. Please do not stay with the, the fun graphs, but do read the text. Uh, there are some things that have been happening that are not in the, the text and people are aware of now, but that was <coughs> happened after publication. We released it in October last year. We're getting ready to rewrite. Uh, for example, the IMF has been doing some amazing <coughs> research on inequality. You know, I'm pinching myself. There's one where growth, <coughs> redistribution, and inequality, and how inequality and failure to redistribute hurt sustainable growth, which is really radical when you uh, coming out of the mouth of the IMF. Granted, it's only a staff note. And there's a newer paper on fiscal policy at inequality. Um, in their work on BEPS in the tax area, uh, base erosion and profit shifting in tax was Phenomenal that the G8 and G20 mandated the OECD and the IMF to do research on this. The IMF is focusing on, on the, um, the cross-border impact <coughs> of tax policies, especially as it applies to developing countries. And they're doing some innovative research. They are looking not just at transfer pricing, but also at unitary taxation and formulary apportionment. They're not going to be coming out recommending necessarily. They are analyzing. But they've been very available to civil society and to researchers. They have a consultation on the website right now. So there have been some good progress in some areas, and a lot more work to go is my concluding statement, sir. Oh, amazing. Brilliant timekeeping. Um, thanks for that, Jim Reed. That was very incredibly clear. Um, what, what I ask you to do before we go into the discussion is to put up the pretty graph with the four um, oh. four actors. But you're going to do it right now, Cyrus. Over to you. Uh, 